Okay, hi, hello, how are you? I hope you're doing well. My name is David Parsons. This is another episode of The Nostalgia Trap. Thank you for joining me. Uh, my guest today is someone who I've been wanting to have on the show for a while. His name is Matt Karp. Uh, he's the author of a new book out from Harvard University Press called This Vast Southern Empire, Slaveholders at the Helm of American Foreign Policy. Uh, and we do a little bit of talking about uh, what all that means, uh, what his project is about, and, and what his next projects will be about. Um, a lot of stuff about, you know, anti-slavery politics, and, and, you know, probably the most fascinating part of this conversation for me was hearing Matt, you know, at the end of this, you know, uh, as, as reluctant as historians often are to do this, uh, we indulge in a little bit of uh, talking about and, and imagining what a, what, a, what a massive project, what a massive Marxist left project might look like today and how it might relate to um, the, the abolitionist project of, of, the, of the mid 19th century that, that led to the Civil War. So uh, this was a, a really fun conversation. We also talked, uh, we did the usual nostalgia trap stuff where Matt told me about how uh, he wound up studying history in graduate school. Um, and we talked a little bit about the, the, the kind of class consciousness that happens when you go to college, uh, particularly the undergrad years of figuring out who you are and your place in society and how you relate to the other, uh, the other uh, pieces of, of the, American, uh, the American project uh, through, the, through the other students and teachers that you meet. So this was a fun conversation. I hope you enjoy my talk with Matt Karp. Um, and if you are enjoying the show, uh, there are two things that I want to ask you to do to, to support the show. One, uh, you can give me money. Uh, sign up at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. Uh, if you give me five bucks a month, I've got bonus episodes and buttons and stickers that I'm sending in the mail uh, and all sorts of other stuff. So sign up that way. Uh, it would really help the show uh, and help me keep going on doing these interviews uh, and putting them up and doing the AMFM stuff because I know uh, I'm enjoying that stuff. I know you are too. So uh, another way you could do it, you could support the show, is go to iTunes and leave a review. Uh, that kind of thing helps we get the show a wider audience and more exposure. So if you don't have money, go leave a review of The Nostalgia Trap on iTunes. I would really appreciate it. Thanks again, uh, and enjoy this conversation with me talking to Professor Matt Karp. Okay, so Matt Carp, I have been wanting to talk to you for a while. Um, your name comes up a lot. You know, I think I, I read your Twitter, um, and and it got, you're like your take on your 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 take on politics of today, but also, um, you know, I, I've seen your book around a lot. It's called The Vast Southern Empire. Is that this, right? Yeah. This, this, va- let's this be specific. Vast, there are yeah, many wait. Southern Vast Southern Empires, but mine is about this one. This one, this <laughs> specific one. <laughs> Um, and you know, you write for Jacobin too, right? I feel like I've seen your stuff on there too. Yeah, I was the kind of like um, Bernie uh, Bernie correspondent during the primary. It you felt were the, like, or were you the prime Bernie bro? Well, there were there were several, but I, I definitely churned out some uh, copy for them. Yeah. Oh man, we're gonna have to get to that. Um, I was the kind of uh, the sort of. Um, uh, pro Bernie Nate Silver for Jacobin. I was doing like getting into the numbers a little bit. Uh, really, you're their yeah. data guy. No, I, nah, I mean, I paid more attention to. Says that. something about about uh, the state of. Um, well, I, I'm not going to knock it. I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm, not, I'm very proud of my work. But uh, yeah, no, I was a little. I descended definitely into like punditry big time uh, during the. Do 16 you regret race. descending into punditry? Uh, no, I think it was. Uh, I, I, you You're know, to be honest, doing it, I feel no, like. no, exactly. Now I just I punted in 140 character increments. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, no, I mean it was a weird timing. I mean we talked about this, but I the book came out. The book I was fran- the fall of 2015. I was like frantically finishing the book. It was my year. I had a year of leave in New York, and then I sent it to like the press for copy edits in like January, like r- basically on the eve of the Iowa caucuses. Okay. And I'd been seeing. Wait a minute. There's this guy who calls himself a socialist who is, you know, pushing. He's ahead of Hillary Clinton in New Hampshire. Like, what's going on? And I'd been sort of sympathetic to the Bernie stuff, and then, I, mm-hmm. but then it was it was kind of just uh, maybe it was destiny, you know, because it was just the and, it was a moment. Both the 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 politics were really kicking into gear, and suddenly I had all this had free time. time. Yeah, yeah. The press is like, okay, we'll get back to you with the copy edits in like two months. So I'm kind of you're in this weird limbo of what are you going to do? You could okay uh, if you're a responsible historian, you're like, I shall begin my second project. <laughs> but if you're me, you're like, oh damn. And so I you know there I went canvassing. There's an election yeah. happening. It's kind 
kind of exciting. And I went, I went canvassing with some people actually up mm. in New Hampshire, and I sort of got – and I read Bernie's memoir, and I kind of got into it. So wow. that was the spring. Uh, and I, I imagine you got into Bernie Sanders um, like most people that, that, that got into Bernie Sanders because you hate women. Does that, has that always been something true for you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, like, no. waiting for a male candidate to come along? It probably goes back to my deep sense of resentment towards my the single mother who raised me. <laughs> right. And I just like I, it's just a sort of a deep sort of reverse Freudian thing where I just hate all women because wait, of that. Yeah. Wait, I, I know we're being glib here, but like – you, the, you might know the numbers because I, 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 I'm still hearing this whole thing of like, oh, if you were for Bernie, you were most likely a privileged white dude, which I don't think the numbers bear that out. I feel like a lot of Bernie sports – I just know this from like CUNY and my students. Like most of the Bernie kids were like well, not – White dudes, right? Well, overwhelming over the overwhelming demographic, uh, you know, category that supported Bernie was young people. I mean, that's right. but, but more than any other more than any other demographic. It's it's the Bernie's Bernie's support were people under under forty and especially under thirty. You know, mm-hmm. it was like you yep. literally couldn't. You know, you were hard pressed to find a a a twenty something Clinton voter who was a Democrat. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, look, okay, look, if you, if you look at the sort of exit polls from the primaries, there's no, I mean, there's no question. I mean, this is a, this is a larger issue to talk about, but there's no question that, that, um, San, the Sanders campaign, like sort of ultimately failed to get sufficient support in some key places mm-hmm. from non-white voters, particularly African-American voters in mm-hmm. the South. Um, uh, and, uh, that's, that's like a real thing that we shouldn't yeah. dodge, but especially, you know, if you're interested in like electoral politics from a left or a social democratic perspective um that you know what went wrong there uh at the same time the sort of the the sort of the narrative about the bernie bro is i think is like was wildly overblown and yeah and if you look at the the people under under 30 you know the the core of bernie's support it was incredibly diverse and bernie did win a majority i think there's some studies that found he did win a majority of of african americans and uh and latinos under 30 right, in right. some states so and and certainly he won i think he was even stronger with women under 30 than with men under 30 so um you know it's 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 complicated yeah. i imagine your reading is probably close to mine of that of what that means that, that it's it's and i know we're not the first people to say this but it seems like young people are the ones that are most fucked over by the kind of neoliberal policies that that sanders is attacking and talking about and he was like the only candidate that was really talking about this stuff that affected their lives more than the lives of older people yeah. who are already have nine to five jobs with benefits and things like that yeah definitely i mean I think I mean there's what was that there was a big study about you know people under thirty are more likely to identify as working class than um, you know than any previous generation mm-hmm. at, 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 at in either contem- either contemporaneously or when they were in their twenties. Wow. So I think there's there's a definite sort of a class politics to it. I mean there's also obviously like Bernie made like direct efforts to engage younger voters. Right. You know the free college stuff. They, he was definitely speaking to their issues to certain sl- slice of issues. But it wasn't. I mean people talk about college campuses going mad for burning they absolutely did but i think um you know the amount of americans who are under the under age 30 who are not college graduates say uh yeah. is large right. and right. a lot of them supported bernie too like a lot of them did you know a lot of people did vote um so you know it, it's it, you, you you don't want to just uh make it about collegiates who are supporting right him. and yeah. i because i feel like and it's certainly true in my case but i think it's true of a, a lot of people uh, that young people that their class consciousness maybe happens out after college or outside of college like in it's in the working world that you really begin to like connect things and begin to be buried by bills and stuff yeah, to think about why. That's true. Where the yeah. rubber hits the road. Well, you're right. kind of in a dreamland to an extent. Like, certainly you're not paying college. I mean, some, some not, this is, this applies, is very different depending on your sure. situation. Some yes. people, you know, they, they, they go in with no illusions because the bill hits them. Right. Other people, okay, they, you know, maybe you take out a loan or you're on financial aid or whatever, but as when you're in college, I think you're right. Maybe, I mean, like for me, I worked in the summers and I had a, mm-hmm. st- uh, you know, a, a work study job, but it was still, it was still a dream ride. Yes. Until after college. And then it's like, okay, you got to find a job. You got to, you know, you realize you're, um, you know, it's not all set up for you. Right, right. Well, I mean, I, I wanted to talk to you about school. I, mean, I didn't, didn't figure we'd talk about Bernie so much at the beginning of this, but I think it's important <laughs> to kind of like, I don't know, frame it a little bit around school because, um, you know, you're at, you're at Princeton now as an assistant professor there, right? Yeah. Um, and the, you're, you're a historian, academic historian. And I want to kind of like, I, I do the same thing in my life. Uh, um, and I kind of wanted to, I guess, 
figure out how that happened for you. How did it happen that you became a historian? Were you into history when you were a kid? Is it something that like was part of your family life? Did people talk about? Uh, are, I guess I, a question I often have: Are there academics in your family? Um, okay, that's interesting. Not really. Yes and no. I guess um, I. I was into history and geography. I sort of had my, like, 1962 world book encyclopedia, you know, and I'd be sitting there just, like, reading that cover to cover, like, all, you know, ev- you know every every country, you know, from Rhodesia mm-hmm. to, to onward. The ones that don't exist Exactly, anymore, exactly. Right? Mostly the ones that didn't exist. Uh-huh. Uh, for, yeah, right, right, from Rhodesia to Yugoslavia. But I, um, yeah, my, so my family situation is a little interesting. My, my, my father is, uh, or was, he, he died this year. He was was a um uh he was a theater director and like the head of a theater program in colorado but i was really raised entirely by my mother okay they parents weren't married and she was and she um and my mother's family really and nobody there was an academic so Mm -hmm. to the extent that i had maybe some of that um you know pull and you know my father you know he went to berkeley for grad school he kind of had an academic career even though he was really more of a director than a a theater person than Mm -hmm. a sort of a a published academic um, but that was – I was sort of aware of that world maybe yeah. indirectly through him. I had a relationship with him. But in terms of my sort of intimate surroundings, it was very – you know, none of my my mother and then my grandparents and my uncles, none of them were really academic at all. And what about politics? Are they – were they political people at all? You, you yeah. Like, it doesn't sound like you're a red diaper baby No, no, definitely not. I mean – they were so I grew up in uh, Montgomery County outside of DC, which is a okay. sort of a famously sort of wealthy uh, suburb aff- or affluent anyway suburb. Uh, although you know there's it's you know it's a big diverse place. But I um, yeah my family were they were you know they're Jew- Jewish liberals mm-hmm. basically yeah. um, and. Uh, not especially radical. My mom had had, my mom was like, you know, a child of the 60s and war protests and so on. But, you know, we had, she had like this giant map of the U.S. out in 1992 when Bill Clinton won. And like, we were like putting like the stickers in each state that Clinton won. And, you know, every, wow. she was like, she had made a full conversion to, to the extent that she was ever unhappy, which I don't know if she was with the Democratic Party mm-hmm. in a kind of structural way. It was completely like good team, bad team. So Boy. I was definitely a, I was a blue state diaper baby. If yeah. you want to put it that <laughs> way, like funny. that was my world and the Cl- very and Clinton deeply. Clinton in 92, right? Because yeah. I, I mean, I was really young for that too. Yeah. Um, but I feel like that was the, he, he vanquished, uh, what, Jerry Brown was the Bernie Sanders of that year, yeah. kind of? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I actually went back, I went back and read a little bit about that race and thinking about Bernie. I mean, that, that Jerry Brown race was weird. I mean, I'm still, I'm not really an expert on it, but he had, he was the kind of lefty and he had some lefty programs, but he also, his like big policy innovation was a flat tax. It's a, it was a really weird world back then. It was an ugly place. I mean, yeah, Democratic yeah. Party has often been an ugly place, but for left wing politics, but it was an ugly place then. It was odd. Uh, I don't know who I, who or what I would have actually supported. Supported in '92, if I were, uh, I think there's a, like a real legendary beef with the Clintons and the, and. The, well, yeah, it was like a big Brown. contested convention, right? And it was yep. like yelling, yelling, "Let Jerry speak, let Jerry speak," oh and, and it was this That's like amazing. intense thing. Was Sarah Silverman there to say, "Stop being ridiculous"? <laughs> yeah, yeah, stop being ridiculous. <laughs> but I mean, Jerry Brown. I mean, that's the thing with Bernie. This was one of my like horses. I I, I beat to death, and then you know played around in the in the, with with the leavings mm. online with this. But Jerry Brown was this big threat to Clinton, and he won a few states. But I mean, Bernie did so much better than any previous insurgent like that and yeah, so like I think that's the important. sarah silverman moment or whatever that weird moment at the convention and just the kind of tension in that room was significant because 40 you know 44 percent or whatever the delegates there were bernie delegates mm. i mean jerry brown won something like a quarter you know at yeah, best yeah. it was he was a rump you know bernie was right. like bernie threatened to take over so i think that is that is that is one difference but yeah to go back to 92 like sure. it was it was – I mean in some ways I still sympathize with that if you think about my mom's experience having – if you th- if you can imagine living the 12 years from 1980 to 1992 yeah, yeah. under oh, yeah. basically pretty hard right Reagan rule and then you know George Bush, the elders, a little different but nevertheless like Republican and to sort of feel like, oh my god. And for me, I remember at the time it was like – We've got our country back. Like, it's possible, like, that, like, somebody who, like, I have some affiliation with can represent the nation. And it was yeah. – that was definitely how I – and then and then coming of age in high school under the realm of – under the, the Clinton scandal mania, it That's was – right. All, my politics were completely determined by, like, resistance to these, you know, insane, obsessed – you know, you know, criminal Republicans yeah. and defending the Clintons at every turn. So it, it is funny that 
that then like last year I spent most of the year like you know going Attacking after Hillary Clinton, Clinton or machine. whatever yeah. yeah yeah or you know working against it in some way I mean not not in the general really but God that that know. I I love that little like capsule you just gave of the history of the Clintons because it it it, it did change and and it, you're right I mean we spent years I mean first of all that Reagan thing and and followed by H W Bush who went to war in, in yeah in, yeah in exactly Kuwait, right and right and, and I and, went with my mom we went to like a war protest you know she was always been very anti-war like she's yeah. been she's a kind of i think there's a certain slice of kind of liberal who's not critical of the democrats but like will never support a war yeah and it, that's not represented among the politicians at all but there's a slice of a sort of voter who's like that and she yeah, so no, we I went know, to a I gulf like war I protest know a lot yeah. of those voters that's yeah. why it was weird during the obama years because i was like where are all those people yeah. because like yeah. obama is waging war all across the world yeah. too and really well it's terrifying different when, ways yeah. Yeah, it's um, different when it's a Democratic president, right? I guess I should put it that way. Yeah, it, they're always opposed to war by a Republican. There's a there's a there's a there's a group, big group of those people. Yeah, no, and I li- but I listened to Joe okay, Kid. You remember the '90s? Um, uh, I was an, a sports talk radio addict. Still, kind of <laughs> yeah, am. Yeah, yeah. Getting off of it a little bit. Uh, I'm getting off of it, weeding twi- myself away. Weeding. I've been moved on to Twitter. It's yeah. kind of like moving from you know I don't know heroin to fentanyl or something. What, like sports Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 like political sports Twitter. Twitter is a fucking sports crazy Twitter's world, too. No, yeah. I have not done sports Twitter. I don't know I don't know sports Twitter. Uh, if you, if yeah. you're already on political Twitter, you don't have time for sports okay. Twitter, too. Okay, okay, okay. I can't deal with that. Yeah. That's that's like uh, TMZ or whatever. Right, or whatever. What exactly. is it? What's the DMT? Yeah. I'm like a grandpa. The yeah. Of, that's the DMT of Twitter. No, but I listened to, so in the sports talk station in D.C. had every morning for whatever reason i mean it's, it's actually pretty characteristic of sports talk radio it's like extremely reactionary they had don imus do the morning show mm. you know imus in the morning yeah. the kind oh, yeah. of like yeah, yeah. who's basically a sort of uh he was basically kind of like more right wing howard stern yeah and his show was a hundred percent clinton scandal all the time and i would like hate listen to it every morning on sp- through on high sports. school like so we're talking about baseball and we're just going to cut in and talk about clinton no like but i but imus wasn't a sports guy i mean like he had a sport he did some sports but it was just a general interest morning talk show yeah but i mean he was the guy who famously got taken down when he made some comment about rutgers basketball right. the nappy headed racist thing. comment yep. yeah uh-huh. and he but he his show was i mean it was it was like stern's edge but yeah. with a little bit more of a kind of right like fox newsy it wasn't quite that way because yeah. they would they would rip on republicans sometimes it, you know it was it was ugly it was a mess it was really reactionary some of those every single skit there that they did in the 90s would be uh grounds for dismissal today yeah um yeah. but and i remember it, i miss it yeah was, he's a creepy and asshole. they just they yeah. just ran four hours of i miss in the morning and then went to sports so it was just like so i would wake up mm. like it probably explains a lot about why I was so ha- unhappy for most of middle school and a lot of high school because I would wake up with like half an hour of Imus like tattooed in my brain yeah, every morning. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and it really shaped me as like, okay, the Republicans are ba- coming out in dialogue with Imus. You, you really can't come away. If that's your, if that's your um, interlocutor to, yes. to be academic, then you come away being like, okay, the Democrats are the answer because this guy and of course. everything they stand for is just so grotesque. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, I think, that, I think that's been a really hard thing to, to navigate for people on the liberal side left side democrat side is kind of like the how do you deal with this monstrous right that's there and real um and i think that explains a lot of tension on among the left of kind of like how coming up with a strategy that because i mean i think you and i probably feel similarly that like a lot of the policies uh, that liberals and austerity politics that they've that they've you know pursued for the last 30 years at least has been you know, fueling a lot of the right and fueling yeah. the the rise of ethno fascism and all the bullshit we're seeing right now. Yeah, that we actually, Completely. Uh, yeah, the left has played a part in. Like, and I have no, but I had no. I mean, just to just to, I'm just as following this thread. I had like no conception of that kind of. Of course not. I had no yeah. vocabulary. I had no. I, I don't think I would have even understood like what a left wing critique of Bill Clinton in say you know as a high school senior what that would have looked no. like. I mean I think I w- I mean there were people there there were you know some people in high school and then you know when I got to college there were who were like the left but I just saw them as sort of utterly insular sectarian rejectionist mm-hmm. they had they basically had they wanted nothing to do with modern life except to like be better than it and reject sure, it sure. and they weren't living in the real world and that was like that was to, so i didn't even probably you know I, I didn't i certainly wasn't in a position to like take any any kind of um left-wing critique of mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. welfare reform seriously right I, you know right. Which shouldn't right. be that hard to do, but, uh, you know. It is. It, yeah. uh, the thing is, I do this on the board sometimes where, I, uh, you know, in class where I'll, like, try put up, up an idea or a, or a figure from history and I'll be like, 
what would an attack from the right on this person or idea be look like and what would an attack on the left yeah from the left yeah. and it's like students are just like what the fuck does that even mean right uh because no, that's those so terms true. are so confusing um, yeah and and it just tells you how little political education there is at and all. it's like and, what would I, re- I remember um i was talking to a friend who was teaching a show teaching a, like a 20th century history pop political history course at princeton i guess and uh i think it's zeller's course and he has signs apparently he has signs like a book on the daily show or something which mm. is at first i was kind of like oh god I, was, I wanted to, like, you know, slip my wrist hearing about this. And I was like, no, actually, that's a really important document if you yeah. want to think about liberalism and what liberal – the evolution of liberalism in the 21st century and yeah. what – so I think I think uh, instead of knocking my colleague, I'll say bravo, Professor Zelzer, who's definitely yeah. not listening to this. Right, right. Uh, but I think that's a great call. But what, what, what he said is he posed this question to students, like, what would a left-wing critique of The Daily Show look like? Mm. And people were like, uh, more liberal, more attacks on the Republicans – like, right, right. Like, just don't m- m- attack Obama at all and just make it 100 percent instead of being 90 percent. Make it 100 percent attack the Republicans. No, how do you like, attack what? liberals? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. And, and, and that, I mean, that, that for me was – I came late to that idea. When yeah. I, I first heard – because I didn't get a master's degree. I, I just went straight into the PhD program. And so when I started, I had – there were all these people in my program that were way smarter than me. And they were all, like, just shitting on liberals, like, the first day of class. And I was like – are they right wing? Like I, just, I like didn't. Yeah. I literally did not understand yeah. that you yeah. could have like this really strident critique of liberalism and be cool and like have politics that I actually <laughs> right. agree with. Well, and have like and a, not be like and, some and, racist Republican or and something. have like a positive. I mean, that for me, that's the thing. And I was actually really. I mean, we can talk about this, but I was really late in coming around to any kind of you know left of liberal worldview because even when i did get a little more sophisticated i felt that like when i sort of came into contact somewhat with with lefty or some version of left-wing politics it, to me it felt um in the early in the early part of the in sort of turn of the century early 2000s it felt very much um just a politics of negation kind yeah. of like yeah. okay yeah obviously the republicans are bad the democrats are bad too Everything the U.S. D- does and has ever done is bad. Yes. <laughs> and it's kind of like that. And it, to me – The how, Howard Zinn school of yeah, radicalism. Well, right, yeah, well, right, 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 right. And in a lot of ways, you know, they're not wrong about uh, much. Yeah. Um, but it's just as a, as a sort of political strategy, as a way of talking about the world and sort of how to change things or to uh, envision how power could be distributed differently and people's lives could be different, it felt like there was just nothing there for me. It was like if you got off on – you know, burning a flag in front of the campus center because, mm-hmm. like, it would piss off somebody. Then, you know, like, hats off to you. But, like, that was never – I was never somebody who was, like, a, a protester puncher. I was kind of like, okay. But right. there was nothing there for me. I would rather – You want a member of the black I'd block. rather play – yeah, I'd be. I'd rather be inside, like, tearing up Rainbow Road, you know, yeah, right, or, yeah. uh-huh. you know, working my way through, Matt, you know, another Madden season. I think that's going to be – the people that tear up Rainbow Road on Mario Kart are kind of the base of the new left. <laughs> <laughs> the no, new it's new true. left. It's true. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the kind of intersection of gaming. Uh, but I was thinking about <laughs> sports because, like, it, you know, didn't Monday Night Football try to put Rush Limbaugh on there for a while? Monday Night Football put Dennis Miller on there for a while, and I'm like, what is this need to like <laughs> yeah, throw right wing douchebags on to like comment Rush about Limbaugh sports? lasted like two weeks, and then he was like, Donovan McNabb, you know, yeah. is overrated because he's black. Yeah, <laughs> and he just yes. he's just gone. <laughs> yeah, he said he basically yeah. said he was like an affirmative action hire. Yeah, right, right, right. Like, right. You know, yeah. I don't know if this mix is working, <laughs> but it's weird just the attempt by multinational corporations yeah. to like throw these dudes. Be like, okay, the- yeah, we're we're gonna see. Okay, in the new new new, we got Joe Buck and Bill O'Reilly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah literally. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Yeah. Um, so uh, the Clinton years, um, where so it sounds like you were what, in were you in high school in the nineties? So yeah, so I went to high school in Walter Johnson. Yeah, I, I graduated yeah. high school ninety nine. So okay. I am yeah. a twentieth century boy. Yeah, uh, and I um, I graduated like a good, a pretty good um, suburban school, and I went to Amherst College. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had the kind of New England like preppy. Um, college experience, you know, if, like it was different. I didn't have, and that for me, that that one thing that I, in retrospect, I realized that I was dealing with in college, although I didn't have a language for it. But like the kind of class shock of, okay, I thought I was, and I was, extremely privileged and affluent mm-hmm. or whatever. I, you know, not really. My I was like single parent, government job, whatever. It was right. like middle class, right? But then I got to compared to other people in my, you know, in my in the Washington D.C. area, of course. But then you get to Amherst and you really see. 
okay, wait a minute. My one roommate is from, there's like three kids from Andover on my hall and, you know, <sighs> and four other kids from Choate and other schools, fancy schools that sound like, you know, unmentionable organs. Yeah, Choate? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did, Groton. I never you heard, I, I don't know if I've heard of Choate. Yeah, all these, you know, the <laughs> Connecticut schools that are yeah. like, you know, different words for, you know, your scrotum or right, something. Right, right, yeah. Um, and, uh, Choate, Taint uh, University. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Geef yeah. Central College. Yeah, yeah exactly. So many. Uh, and, um, and you know, but it was, it was definitely like, whoa, these people are living in a different world. And I'm like, I don't really understand mm. where, you know, this, and I wasn't, is that, is that class consciousness that you just, I don't know. I think it was a, some kind of awakening of yeah. some sort, although I wouldn't have put it in those terms because I didn't necessarily even hate it. I, I, I didn't, neither did I say, oh, I want to aspire to this. I want to like. Why don't I have high school stories about, like, taking vacations to Montreal and, like, renting a hot tub and, like, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever these, you know, people are doing? Yep. Um, but I um, – but, w- but, it w- but it was definitely a consciousness of difference, I guess I would put yeah, it that way. Sure. And that, you know, oh, wait, uh, on Saturday morning I've got to, like, actually empty the recycling for these people's dorms, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever for my work mm-hmm. study job. Again – let me not pretend to be some kind of working class hero uh, at the campus of no, Amherst but College. No, it's important. Everyone but, has yeah, their own kind yeah. of coming to terms with yeah. it, whatever that is. Yeah, but it was definitely like, okay. like, And then, you know, then when I met my good friends in college, and I did ultimately have a really good time, you know, in the Rainbow, world, Rainbow Road world. <laughs> yep. And, yeah, and there were a couple of us, you know, who had kind of like, you know, most of the people there, they weren't like the Andovers, but they were – you know, you know, they had, a, you know, two, a doctor and a lawyer and they had a, you know, a giant house somewhere. And, mm-hmm. and, and then there were a couple of my friends who had kind of, you know, that, you know, dad was a poster worker, or mom was a teacher kind of thing. It was right, like my best right. friend yep. or, you know, whatever. And like they, and it's not surprising to me looking back that like, those are the friends now who are like more passionately Bernie lefty sure. types yeah. who like just definitely have a different, you know, it's like, you know, substrata within, within strata in terms mm-hmm. of class. And, you know, we're all at Amherst. We're all, um, you know, we're, we've all made it, you know, or whatever, it, but it's, it's, it's a different, it's, it's, it's a slightly different experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, um, no, I agree. That it's very familiar to me going to, going to college and f- kind of figuring out a little more. I mean, I say this to my students uh, a lot, uh, uh, like at CUNY, cause I'm like, I, when we're talking about class, I, I ask them to consider why they're why they're not at Harvard, or why why was that not an option for you? Why are you not yeah. in the military right now? What were the choices yeah. that were available to you? What do they say? Uh, well, the, it was in the context of a student last last week that kind of raised his hand in class to say that you know there used to be barriers to people advancing in capitalism, but there's not anymore. Like you can, anyone can succeed. Anyone can do anything they want. And I said, no, so why aren't you at Harvard? I just like, I just asked them, why aren't you? <laughs> I guess you're you just know? too dumb then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. basically it's your fault, right? Yeah. And, you know, he kind of gave me the, you know, I understand. I get what you're saying. You know, it seemed like he understood what I was, the point I was making. But the yeah. schools though, especially like the Amherst and the Harvards do such a good job of, you know, you get there, your opening day convocation. You know, it's bullshit, whatever. You just really want – I mean, most kids are just waiting for everyone to shut up and they can get back and start drinking. But still, <laughs> not really because they've got, like – I think we had, like, Mario Cuomo come right. and give this, like, big kind of, like, kind of galvanizing speech about, you know, whatever, the future of the country. And then and then the president came and was like, and you are the leaders of this world. And, you you know, you come. And it was, like, you know, the sort of demographic profile of the class in very selective ways. And we have a magician from North Carolina and a, an Olympic <laughs> hurdler and, a, you know, whatever, whatever – and it's like all of these fascinating, like uniquely skilled people who are sort of able to, um, who are diverse, and but then most importantly are are here because you're all special. And mm. it's deep. It's not no one, no meritocrat likes actually being called a meritocrat unless they're like soulless. Right. But right. It, that ideology of meritocracy goes so much deeper than just sort of saying like I am meritorious. It's just a sort of a sense of specialness or a consciousness of like this is a this is a place that is. Um, you know, that is really popping, that is really alive with yeah. people who are somehow different and superior. You know, even if you don't want to put it that way exactly, it's – and it – it at it, no point – it took me till many years after college that I realized, like, you know what really mostly set these people aside is that almost all of them were rich. Like, yeah, you know, right. that that was just like that is if you're just building a sociology <laughs> yeah, of Amherst uh-huh, College, yeah. you have to start with that. And I just, like, didn't even get it. I was aware of some differences, but I didn't even get it. Yeah. yeah no, I, it, it makes me think of the opening scene of uh, this movie Social Network where the Mark Zuckerberg character is, like, talking <laughs> about, like, these social clubs at, uh, at, yeah. at Harvard. And he seems to have a really deep – the character, at least, as he's portrayed in the film, has a deep consciousness – of the fact that they're like in a special place, they're special yeah. people, and yeah. they have access to rooms in which 
uh, uh, they can talk to people that are incredibly powerful and you yeah, can key them yeah. into the whole fucking yeah, world, yeah, basically. Yeah. Every, the five billionaires that run the place. No, that, I mean, that expresses a certain truth. I mean, I think it would be interesting to sort of look at um, the leadership of the Democratic Party and see how many of them, you know, just look at the Democratic Senate. How many of them went to like selective colleges? Yeah. I just think uh, undergraduates. Yeah, that would be an. Int- I'd be interested to know. I mean, maybe it's not that many, may- but I-, I suspect that there is a kind of mentality that comes out of there that it's really hard to shake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it seems you know. like it was President Amherst when you were there. Yeah. Oh no. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it wasn't. You know. And and it's it, what should be said is that if you're there, it's not. Um, um, I, first, for one, okay, a couple of things should be said. Some people, you know, I think probably had a really hard time at Amherst, you sure. know, people, because it is like we're repelled by, you know, I think, you know, I think when I was there, they, they recently changed it, have made it, have made their like ad- acceptance. They, they do a sort of a much more like class diversity and acceptance, sure. and it's become more racially diverse as well. So I'm sure there were a lot, of, I mean, it was very segregated and uh, et cetera. There are all sorts of things that were sort of, that I can imagine people having a really hard time at Amherst. Like my freshman year was really bad, but uh, but but like ultimately, if you kind of get in there, mm-hmm. it's really comforting yeah. and like it's sure. really sustaining. And I just think we should, to be honest, people being critical of certain kinds of worldviews, like we should remember that for the people who are kind of on the inside, like this system really works profoundly. Not just in the sense that they get fat paychecks and like get to live in big houses or whatever, but that they get to sort of feel a sort of a consciousness of satisfaction and like belief in, you know, what they're doing and who they are. Yeah. And almost like a belief in the fundamental goodness and benevolence of what they're doing just by virtue of the fact that they're there in that position. Yeah. And and there's all sorts of outreach happening. You know, people are going to Holyoke to like teach classes Mm -hmm. and, you know, or whatever. And, you know, there's, there's, it's hard to, it 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 becomes hard to critique because sometimes I'm like, they are doing good stuff. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I kind of wanted to be in this world in part because I do believe in it, and to, in, at least into the project of academia and yeah. what a university can yeah. be, and and how uh, how education helps people both within the university and outside of it. I mean, I believe in a lot of that stuff, and I romanticize a lot of it, but I also, you know, I'm very critical of the kind of class dimensions of so much of it because of the stuff you're talking about. I mean, I wanted to ask you, were you studying history in Amherst? So, yeah, so I, um, I was, I did, I, so I always did like history, even though I didn't have any, I didn't have a serious, like, history academic models. Like, mm-hmm. my grandfather and I would always sit around, he would, like, talk to me about Napoleon and stuff, and he was, like, a, he was, like, a kind of a classic, you know, history, you know, grandpa history buff. Yeah. Um, but, um, but, like, we, so I, I, that, it wasn't, like, a big decision to, like, become a history major. Mm-hmm. I was, it was either, I guess, maybe, I liked English, too, but it was, in the did end, I was, like. you have a career? in mind you no you're gonna go to nothing. grad school or I was, lawyer or anything like no, that no i was like resolutely like uncertain and like not even uncertain implies that you're asking questions i was just kind of like living you know semester by semester uh mario and, kart exactly up, mario kart and madden yeah. exactly and yeah and reading about you know i took a bunch of courses on u.s diplomatic history sure. and a bunch of um you know none of this thing none of these things radicalized me i was like still very like a kind of a liberal dem- like a actually if anything i became a little more conservative at college mm. i became a little more um moderate or whatever like yeah. i sort of that was my re- collegiate rebellion Did was you- that i sort of was like i read a jason de book on like welfare reform and i was kind of like okay well i don't completely agree with this but like you know actually work fair is a good idea you know like i actually had some really horrible ideas <laughs> i, I love, mean i was 21 <laughs> i love to tell embarrassing stories about yeah. uh my politics you know i think there was probably a moment in the 90s where i probably i probably quote like literally describe myself as like socially liberal but fiscally <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. such a classic yeah, asshole yeah. <laughs> I th- and i honestly think i said that because i heard the guy from blues traveler describe himself that way <laughs> And I was like, my politics are pretty Even much better. Blues traveler. Yeah. yeah. No, I'll tell you what. Adam Duritz uh, yeah, he had likes much. Guns and weed. He seems cool. Adam Duritz of the Counting Crows had much better <laughs> politics than me in the '90s because I remember I saw him. And he came, the Counting Crows, like, came to, actually, I think I was at my girlfriend, I was, my girlfriend was at Yale at the time, and I went and saw him there. And he was, like, kind of rant, he was kind of, like, you know, complaining about the war in Afghanistan. And people were like, just play Mr. Jones! Yeah. And I was definitely like, yeah, come on, round here! Like, enough of the rants! <laughs> right, yeah, <enough. laughs> give me Omaha! Yeah, we don't need here in Afghanistan. So, Adam, jo- uh, Adam Duritz, that's a win for you, sir. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, I was an idiot. Wow, yeah. that's amazing, because yeah. I, I, I wrote him off. 
You know, I wrote him off as a, <laughs> as a bad poet of the 90s. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know about his poetry. I don't even know about his politics, but he definitely – yeah, I mean, to be honest, it was so it was actually on foreign policy that I was most – I wasn't really gung-ho for welfare reform. It was more that I kind of – uh, I had a teacher, Gordy Levin, who mm-hmm. actually wrote a like a Bancroft winning book on like Woodrow Wilson's foreign policy. I don't know if you know it. Mm-hmm. Um, in the '60s, as like a con- basically as a Marxist, as like the, the book is completely. Um, uh, you know, in, in the sort of uh, uh, William Abman Williams school, maybe, but plus more Marxism. Mm. And those are usually boring books, oftentimes. Yeah, no, well, it was, like, I think like it's, straight, it's I'm a, looking at like Gabriel Coco, Coco, yeah, like Anatomy yeah. of a War. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You know, straight he, Marxist interpretation of Vietnam, and it's like, oh, it's a slog. It's a little. I mean, it's not the most <laughs> sizzle. It's not a sizzler, but anyway. But but Levin, this guy Gordy Levin, who's a, he was a great teacher, he was Coco's like contemporary, and I uh-huh. think at at uh, in grad school, whatever they were friends. But then he made the neocon turn and when did was that a 9-11 thing uh no i think he did it in the i think it must have been in the 70s or wow, something okay. it might have been yeah. early it might have been an israel thing i don't know i don't know enough about his intellectual history he would be i'd, I'd love to hear i mean no, no one else would care that much but i'd love to hear you interview him <laughs> but he uh to get his biography um yeah i love the older he, scholars he's a Good great stuff. he's a great he was a great classroom teacher and he like mm-hmm. we read he collected all of these documents on u.s diplomatic history like and it was really about the 20th century and like, i took like three classes and they were all different parts of the 20th century basically cool. i mean there was one class that kind of went back into the stuff i ultimately ended up doing but really and he was he was a soft neocon he wasn't like a um, you know, he wasn't like a Richard Pearl type at all, mm. but he was, it was, it was just definitely, um, uh, neocon is probably too strong a word even for it, but it was definitely like when the Iraq war was the big thing that was happening in 2002. And it made me thinking about, and I don't think Levin was pro Iraq, but he was very critical of the kind of no blood for oil critics of Iraq. Okay. And yeah. that's the position that I ended up kind of inheriting being mm-hmm. like, okay, this is a bad idea. This is they're gonna like Bush is gonna botch this. I don't trust Republicans, but um, but this is not uh, like this is not a like the the Chomskyist critique or whatever was like it, to my mind it didn't make sense. It you was didn't like see it as like straight resource war. No, it was like it was like theory. democracy. Yeah. You know, like I actually thought like oh like you know they're gonna try to you know build a market democracy in Iraq. Like it probably won't work, but like you know that's not a terrible idea. Like you know th- and that was that was my like stupid view is that still your reading of what's going on there is it is it gone back to no blood for a while i don't know I, <laughs> you know it's funny like i haven't i haven't read i mean i i certainly think the iraq war was um i think i think no i i to be honest i think that the democracy reason was th- why they were able to pull it off i think the neocons really i don't th- I, I mean i think there were certainly uh elements in that cadre who were you know v- were not who were undeceived but i think the ideology of spreading democracy and your market democracy in to the Middle East through this like sublime opportunity. And I feel like I can say this yeah. because I caught that bug a little bit. Mm-hmm. Not enough to ever like support the war, but enough to sort of be insufficiently opposed to it. And so I think that was an important like ideological tick for them. They really thought that, you know, um, you know, Saddam is a butcher, mm-hmm. we'll take him out and liberate, you know, this is gonna be a war of liberation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it sounds crazy to say because their hands are dripping in blood now. But um, but I think that I think I don't think it would have ha- would it wouldn't have happened. I don't think like Bush would have done it if he didn't see it that way. Yeah, and and it, I mean it, 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 the way you describe it, it, it sounds consistent with it with reading it as kind of like it's a flexing of a certain type of American power. It's, it seems to be about American power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. I mean, there was this chauvinism was a huge part of it, and like yeah. sort of restoring you know America's capacity to sort of be a force for good in the world. I mean, and I do feel like in a way I, I have this like weird little understanding of it because I. Coming out of Levin's class where we, you know, coming out of, you know, uh, kind of uh, where I had this sort of uh, sense of the Cold War in which, you know, the Soviet Union was the villain. And the mm-hmm. Soviet Union was, rep- was a repressive regime that, you know, was murderous. And the United States, for all of its flaws, you know, which as a liberal, you're always willing to sort of grant in the abstract or whatever, um, you know, for all of its flaws, the United yeah. States, like, was in this, like, global wrestling match the side of good. And so, you know, to sort of then 
um, you know, to sort of like post Vietnam have a sort of sense of diminished capacity. You don't have to be a Reaganite to say, oh, well, you know, like it actually would be good if the United States did more in the world as opposed to yeah, all yeah. sorts of the other bad stuff that's out there. And that's what that's that. So that was my worldview. And it's, it's such a slippery slope from there to just like hawkish intervention yeah. everywhere. Well, you, you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, this is Chomsky. I think that like so much of the language of imperialism, war, et cetera, is always like couch kind of progressive language. Yeah. And it's very easy to get yeah. seduced by that yeah. idea. I mean, I just looked at – I just watched a clip of Hubert Humphrey in 1968 making the argument that he should be president. And he was saying, you know, Jesus once said, blessed are the peacemakers. But I want to underline the word maker there. because <laughs> Wait, really? Yeah. Uh-huh, That's awesome. Uh-huh, because he's like, there's a lot of work and a lot of like – Basically, a lot of violence and death you have yeah. to you have to perpetrate in order yeah. to create peace. What, yeah, well, I mean, what is he, he? Doesn't he say another time? I don't bring peace, but the sword. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You need the sword to make the peace. Uh-huh. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, and I feel like you know, I mean, I talked about this with uh, with uh, with Matt Chrisman uh, on on this show. The, the idea of like, like that know, episode. This, the, yeah, yeah. This kind of like. Uh, this, I mean, it is kind of hyper masculine, but but it's just this need for some sort of like righteous violence and the and, and the idea of like the because he talked about like the Civil War being an entryway for a lot of young males to like think about like killing people, but it being good and being the right thing, yeah, being moral and like being a superhero essentially. Right now, well, I mean, to be honest, I mean, and this is where I have to admit like my own um, a degree of like inconsistency in my own politics today because you know now I have you know I I completely recant obviously <laughs> like all of my even my like ambivalence about um, you know the war in Iraq like I you know very mm-hmm. much anti intervention in Syria and so on um, but. But yeah, when it when it comes to the Civil War, it's like you know, and I I feel like actually Matt would probably cop to this to a certain extent too. Yeah. Because when it comes to the Civil War, it's like no, they didn't do enough. Like right. like Sherman yeah. did not burn like he failed to burn enough of Georgia, yeah, and that it. was the problem. Yeah, that's yeah. why Django Unchained is so satisfying at the end. But it's like the the, the idea of like I mean, he, we talked about how he brought up John Brown, and he was just like, God, John Brown like just killing people with broadswords just owns, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah, something yeah, yeah. so awesome. About yeah, that. yeah. And I'm like. Yeah, there, 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 there's something inside us that that, that has no, to, and that I think, responds to that for sure. I, I do think that there is like, in terms of like the internet left today, there is a certain kind of like obvious machismo. Be- leaving aside the sort of Bernie bro, cri- you know, critique the that Antifa is levied, t- thing, levied, punching Nazis. L- levied by the sort of um, yeah. Well, that's an, that's that's I think that's related. I was going to talk about something slightly different. Yeah, the sort ahead. of although it, it overlaps the um. Uh, the, the, okay, the people who are ideological enemies who are using the Bernie bro thing to discredit, discredit universal social democracy are obviously cynical and, you know, basically villainous, but the, but the people who, um, but I think that not, that notwithstanding, you've got to recognize that, you know, with things like Chapo Mm -hmm. and I'm sure those guys would acknowledge it, that there is this like obvious, like kind of masculine energy that I am a part of that, um, that is. Is it, it, in some ways it has like a weird tension with the politics when yeah. it comes to something yeah. like um, when it comes to something like in, like our view of foreign policy and our view of the Civil War, where it's like mm-hmm. the Civil War becomes. I mean, I think you could this would be maybe unfair, but you could do like a a sort of a slightly hostile reading of it's like you know. All of these, like, bros who are so excited to sort of talk about, like, you know, Sherman crushing the South and, like, Thaddeus Stevens, like, yep. exiling the planners and just, like, murk them, kill them. Yep. And yep. that's, like, a way to, like, like sort of blow off the energy which they've decided not to put into, like, contemporary global conquest. And let me say, that is much better than <laughs> if all of these left bros were out there, like, trying to support, uh, you know, U.S. invasions of distant countries. Right, right. But it's still, there is that energy. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, it's yeah. something that it's, it's uh, I think probably like someone like Zizek would have something to say about it because he's got a darker kind of <laughs> yeah. reading of, like, humanity and what yeah. we are. Yeah. Maybe uh, Werner Herzog. Um, but I think about that stuff a lot because it's like uh, there's the, the human nature thing that intersects with politics in really interesting ways i want to do i want to make sure we go back to, yeah let's continue to, the narrative to, to yeah the, we're to, still in like 2002 or something yeah like yeah. how do you how do you eventually get into um into studying slavery like how do you go back to that like what's the connection that you go because like what, what you end up studying in graduate school I, I mean i feel like it was kind of in part accidental um a co- you know collection of like professors that were around me and what they were interested in and and i knew that i wanted to study the 60s in vietnam and i ended up finding something but 
what how did you get to the 1830s and 1840s um yeah it's interesting so i had my like 20th century like sort of diplomatic history kind of education of a certain kind that i came out of a co- co- undergrad with yeah and so then i went to for the first thing i did is i didn't really know what i wanted to do i tried to get like a, every all my friends were like trying to get prep schooling jobs that was like mm-hmm. the last thing you could grab a hold of mm-hmm. teaching right out of college I fortunately I didn't get any of those jobs. They saw right through me that I was totally un- unqualified to teach. Uh, With just your undergrad degree, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there are prep schools that will hire you like that. Sure, so, yeah. um, but I didn't. I fortunately didn't get one of those jobs. So I went to DC and I ended up working in like the contractor for the depart- for like basically Rod Page's Department of Education, mm-hmm. like making propaganda about how like No Child Left Behind was oh, you know God. going so the Bush years. Yeah, now yeah. it's the Bush years, and I again, you know, I wasn't really. I mean, I was very anti Bush, but I, it was a it was a to be honest, it was a total do nothing job. Yeah, I probably spent forty five minutes a day working, and the other the, like I literally would like break out books like mystery oh, novels man, I just love read at my desk jobs. yeah yeah it was it was it was a kind of people were like that job was me so miserable like no i love it yeah but <laughs> well, actually i didn't love it that much because i was like i gotta get out of here and sure. do something so yeah. i went to um I, yeah i went to grad school and i got into Penn and um my advisor's there and i knew i wanted to do the 19th century i was like okay, okay. the 20th century there's almost like too much going on there mm-hmm. i felt like i needed to sort of i wanted to i felt like what is the sort of the richness and the depth of the sort of reading that I'd done on and the sort of ideological um, stakes that are so present in 20th century international history, mm-hmm. uh, diplomatic, U.S. diplomatic history that are global and that are really pitting, you know, you know, ideas and sort of political economies against each other. I was like, OK, but the 19th century, like it felt in, in terms of the American case, it just felt much more barren and much more kind of dry and less – connected to like urgent issue urgent questions like that Mm -hmm. and i thought okay let's but i had no idea what i wanted to study other than something maybe probably before the civil war um uh and i went uh, i think uh, a lot of it is the accident that like the best place i got in my two advisors uh were the the place that made the most sense for me because like my girlfriend was in new york at the time Mm -hmm. and so i went to penn and philly we could you know stay together and you know they were southernists they were i mean Mm -hmm. steve hahn Mm -hmm. is you know his you know, uh, first book was on Southern populism. His second book was on, you know, African-American political struggle in the South. Uh, Stephanie McCurry uh, was my other main advisor, and she had written a big book on, uh, you know, yeoman households in mm-hmm. South Car- Antebellum, South Carolina. So they were deep. They were both like Southern Marxists, basically. Yeah. And, yeah, that's what I was gonna and so, yeah, yeah, so I think both ideologically and regionally, yeah. they ended up exerting a kind of um, I, I, regionally, it was a very direct influence because it was like, okay, well, I should definitely do a Southern topic. And ideologically, it was more ambiguous because they're, they're very far from propagandistic yeah. about stuff. Um, but I think it rubbed off. So your, your book ends up being about foreign policy and slavery and the slave powers and how they were kind of envisioning themselves uh, with regard to geopolitics, which is something I, I – I've, I mean, I've thought of, but it just seems like a really, really rich contribution to to the to the historiography. I mean, was it so? What what were your? What was the moment where you felt like I found this project? Was there a moment where you're like, this is this is a what I'm doing? Yeah, it's weird. I was no. It took it took a while. I was casting around. I was like, my first year, my seminar paper was on like I proposed writing a paper on like why. Uh, you know, like the election of 1844 basically determined the annexation of Texas, like James Polk's, Mm -hmm. you know, defeating Henry Clay, Mm -hmm. you know, basically paved the way for annexation. I was like, this is a really consequential election that basically led to, um, you know, the Civil War in effect. Actually, there's a the historian Gary Kornbluth has this whole mm-hmm. crazy. Have you read this mm-hmm. counterfactual? I've, name, I've, yeah. I've, I, I, it's it's actually one of the wilder things that has been published in the Journal of American History. But if anyone's interested in like non Harry Turtle Dove style counterfactual history, he literally builds. He works forward an alternate universe where Henry Clay wins in 1844 and there's wow. no civil war. <laughs> and you know it's not entirely persuasive as these things can't be. But it was like okay, this is a hinge point and. Basically, it all came down to New York City, and it was, like, rainy that day, and why did – and I was, like – I literally was, like, I want to find out, like, why Henry Clay lost New York uh, to Polk. Mm-hmm. And and I, like, proposed this, but I had, like, no idea how to do that, and, like, basically my advisor just, like, laughed. Like, this is a fishing expedition. You'll never do anything. And I was, like, okay. I had written my undergrad thesis on the annexation of Texas. This was okay. partly what was – I had, okay. so I yeah, already was moving sense. in that yep. direction a little bit. And then I was, like, you know what? Let me just – instead of trying to figure out, like – 
like like some uh, 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 you know find some needle in a haystack about you know like why you know some big thing happened that I'm not going to understand. Let's try to understand something that did happen and why were these southerners so keen on texas yeah, yeah. and what was what was i mean okay it's expansion but what else what was what was driving it and partly i think given that i was interested in the politics of texas and the, the undergrad thesis had been about um british foreign policy basically and how the Brit- british viewed the texas question and I, so i knew that i wanted to think about it in the international in international stakes and think about a balance of power in the 19th century which sometimes we don't do you know that's a very you know on the north american continent anyway you mm-hmm. think about it a lot in european history but like to the extent to which there was a bounce of power and then connect that to 20th century ideas about this being an ideological as well as a um you know merely sort of strategic territorial question yeah, yeah. where like freedom and slavery but i don't think i can so it was really fits and starts i don't think i came to it right away i was like okay i want to write about slaveholders there wasn't one particular source you found or set or archive or set no of definitely sources. not i mean it was it was definitely about okay these southerners wanted to do the annexation of texas and i was aware that they were tuned into international questions like yeah. maybe more than i'd read about so i was like okay they really care about great britain a lot in 1844 you know 1843 1844 when they're mm-hmm. they're afraid of britain ab- abolitionizing texas and mm. they're afraid of but they're thinking about slavery in international terms so i'll go with that but i don't really know i was i was really i was like could i even at, the, at that point i was actually scared that it, i wouldn't be basically it would be a terrible idea and i wouldn't be allowed to do a dissertation just about southern politicians mm. That yeah. It was actually a different moment, I think, in the academy that um, – where that was like my big fear. Even as the project started slowly moving forward, I was like, okay, well, I still need to – I need to figure out. I need to do – I mean, Steve and Stephanie, unlike me, are social historians. Mm-hmm. They are actually built from the ground up in terms right. of like their, the social world of the South is like very powerful in their works. Whereas I'm, you know, in comparison, skimming along the surface, I'm thinking about high politics and yeah. international affairs. And, you know, it's ideological and like the stakes, it really matters. But in I was I was like afraid to do some sort of old fashioned diplomatic history. Sure. I needed to figure <laughs> out how to like connect this to some sort of social question. And I ended up and I was like, I was like, OK, yeah, like you can't you can't do a diplomatic history. But but so I ended up just kind of going with it, and then maybe it was the Navy. That was like my first article. I found some stuff about mm. – uh, this is now like my fifth year of grad school though. Yeah. So yeah. I was still like – I was still not at all very confident in my project. That I, But I'd found some stuff about why were these Southerners like uh, pushing this gi- giant expansion of the Navy in 1841, 42. It didn't make sense given what we know about the South being kind of provincial and mm-hmm. opposed to a strong federal government. And, you know, and it seemed connected to Texas and to international conflict over slavery. And then I was like, okay, maybe I should, like, write this up as an article. And that way it could be a dissertation chapter. And then that – at that point, I think my advisor was sort of like, okay, there's sort of enough here that – Maybe I don't need to do a whole chapter on, like, the yeoman and slaves <laughs> right, and, you right. know, like, I didn't need to do a whole social portrait also. Well, what, what I like about it is that, you know, it's, it's, it's work on slavery that is away from slavery in some respects. It talks more about, like, the slave power and the big power yeah. of, of, like, you know, what is, what is fueling this? What are the ideological parameters of it? And, and you know, I feel like – and I don't I – don't, I'm not a slavery or 19th century historian, so I'm not an expert on any of this stuff, but – I feel like like a lot of movies came out while you were working on this. That like slavery <laughs> became a subject in American life. We had a black president. Black Lives Matter is happening. Consciousness of slavery is like in Hollywood. But but I wonder if you would agree with this because it feels like so much of the kind of American imagination about slavery is concentrated on the like brutality of slavery and the yeah. kind of like the body being whipped and punished. And we end up, I feel like a lot of Americans see slave owners. They, they think of them as overseers. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like they think of huh, that's what that's slave owners are. Yeah. And that's what the slave power is, is I the guy that. that's actually just some dumb redneck beating the shit out of a black person. And it's like, well, that's the on the ground element, but that, that misses the whole labor system. I, 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 that's that's interesting. Yeah, I think that's I hadn't I hadn't heard it put that. But I like that idea. I think there's there's definitely and there's a, a big camp in some of the recent movies, especially, say, like Django Unchained. I think 12 Years a Slave is a little bit better on this, it, although it definitely partakes of it. Smart movie. Um, yeah. But J- Django is a really good example of like, yeah, slavery is basically sadism. Right. It's basically an excuse to, to sort of it's 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 an excuse sort of for, um, you know, white uh, sadism to uh, annihilate black bodies and stage and basically stage. I mean, he stages for, fights. For, uh, yeah, and, exactly, and, and, exactly. And, and for no a sexual pleasure, out for of no it. purpose yeah. other than their own the amusement and, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and 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 like violent hatred. And that 
you know, yeah. So that's 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 definitely wrong. When, you, when your, <laughs> your work kind of, of reveals, slavery, I yeah. think, and this is what I wanted to bring up, is that your work, I think, reveals that slavery is it's, it's a lot scarier when you see it as like a rational system made by men making rational economic decisions. Yeah, yeah. No, abs- I mean, you know, rational. You know, to the extent right. that anybody's rational. But yeah, yeah no. But Within that it's a labor. Context. It's a labor system. Yeah, that it's a that it's a system that is, of, of course, unimaginably brutal and depends on all sorts of coercive violence and and completely licenses all sorts of horrors that are depicted in you know 12 years a slave for Mm -hmm, instance sure but i think what that movie does do unlike django is it depicts uh you know the you know the first scene right the opening scene of uh 12 years a slave right it's like here's how you you know there he's solomon north was being told how to like cut sugar cane that's right and how you do it it's like okay their labor is turning into profit for the master and that's the reason why they're 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 there you know they're there to make profits for the master to sort of to to serve as the working class in this incredibly abusive system Mm -hmm. but it's not for the abuse's sake and i do i do think like popularly we don't we don't see it in those terms um uh, I mean, that's part of it is that that the reason why Solomon Northup, the movie about the, the 12 Years Slave movie is so good is because Solomon Northup's narrative is so good. And the yeah. way he writes about – he has a whole chapter on like literally how do you grow cotton? How do you pick mm-hmm. cotton? Mm-hmm. How do you cut cane? How do you grow cane? How do you cut cane? What's, what are the rhythms of life? What is the sort of labor system like? What is – and you know, there's no way to sort of get away from the centrality of that. Uh, and there's when you're a scene in the, the movie where the, the, they're they're kind of being lectured and ultimately punished over because one one slave has produced more cotton than everybody else, and, and right. they're kind of like saying, "Well, that's that's what's po- that's the level of production that's possible. That's what we expect now." Right. And uh, yeah, it does do a, a, a pretty good job of underlying the the weighing machine, yeah, right? It's like right. okay, you hit 200 pounds today, and if you don't, I mean, it was really horrific the way he talks about it. It's like you hit 200 today. Oh, that's a good number, but you better beat it tomorrow, you know? And like, and then that becomes the sort of constant goad then they're doing this in the amazon warehouses like right now i right. mean it's not slavery right. in the in, it's not antebellum slavery but it's a uh, you know the same kind of rational thing that's kind of you know the, applying a data model to labor and trying to extract as much as possible right um i wanted to ask you about because I, I feel like your book does one of it the, one of the main things that it does for us is kind of takes the attention away from that and, and moves it to like the kind of powers that are that are conceiving of slavery as as something very important to the whole thing project that they're doing and like a national project. But I feel like uh, it, it, your your book kind of kind of destroys the state's rights argument, well, right? Well, whatever because, was left of it, right? Yeah, I, yeah. yeah I, it's still there. The I zombie. Mean, my students yeah. still bring it up because <laughs> they, they said that when I ask why the Civil War happened, because we, we did the Trump thing, you know, yeah. like Trump doesn't know why the yeah. Civil War happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so many of my students were like, "It's states' rights, isn't it?" The Civil it? Like, War, why? Like yeah. they've heard about it. They've heard that. In other words, like they've heard of the states' rights thing. They yeah. know it's one interpretation. Yeah. But your, I mean, your work. How how does it how does it tell us that that's not true? Well, okay. There, I mean, there are couple obvious ways that it's not true like the simplest thing is you know states rights to do what i mean this is like the easiest answer to that question Mm -hmm. like literally what did the states want to do what rights were being violated even if you read the south carolina declaration of secession uh which is probably the most kind Mm -hmm. of legalistic and sort of constitutional and it's uh, you know the mississippi one is just like we want our slavery which is the world's greatest driver of uh of profit and civilization like really flat out south carolina south carolina and, and most documents are like that by the way um you know they're they'll in terms of like the historical sources they just say it mm. um but south carolina you know they do sort of offer a bunch of sort of constitutional um you know and kind of like a sort of states rights justifications but ultimately when you when you read through it all of their laments about the violation of their state rights are about the North not enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act. You know, the mm-hmm. North, uh, the North uh, kind of menacing their slave property in violation of the Constitution. The North preventing slave property to expand into the territories in violation. So it's always states' rights to do what? Is yeah, like this, that's a good way. States' of putting rights it, is yeah. like literally not an explanation. Like I would, I, I'm, I'm here if you want to argue that it was the tariff. Like you're wrong, but the tariff is at least the alternate explanation. I mean, nobody talks about the tariff, so it's not the tariff, right? But the tariff is at least an alternate explanation that has substance, you know, that, like, they seceded because they were afraid the North was going to raise the tariff. Okay. But states' rights is not even an explanation. It's just – it's like rhetoric. And it it, it misses it. So whatever. That argument is dead. But if you want to talk about why – 
um, what my book does on that question is it's not just about um, – we in historians as opposed to like you know whatever uh, you know high school students or whatever mm-hmm. – um, know that the states' rights thing is not has been, you know, that the South has not been overly enamored of states' rights when it came into conflict with slavery. Right. I mean, for instance, the Fugitive Slave Clause, the Fugitive Slave Law, uh, you know, Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution and then in uh, the Law of 1793 and then enforced in 1850, all driven by slaveholders who want to use the federal government to enforce slave property, overriding state rights and state laws in the north that kind of set up due process for the mm-hmm. slaves mm-hmm. who are accused of being runaways or any black person who's accused of being a runaway etc they're happy to use the federal government to get back their slave property but we kind of know that what my book does it's a little bit ex- that expands beyond that to some extent is that it's not just about this sort of narrow okay we'll take states rights when it helps our property we'll take the national government when it helps our property yeah it's also about a kind of more holistic world vision mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. about how slavery it's not just that they need the federal government to guarantee property rights, although they do, they also want the federal government to sort of enhance the power of um, their class on a hemispheric stage in the sense that the future of North America, the Caribbean, um, uh, you know, really South America too, is kind of hanging in balance between, you know, what is the labor system and what is the sort of economic, um, you know, what are the, what is the structure of the economy is that's going to develop in these places and is, the is racial it an system too. Vision uh, over an industrial vision? Uh, that not what, stri- that I don't think happening? strictly. I mean, I think certainly they think that. In, I mean, their view is that the future of the Western Hemisphere has to be slaveholding and mm-hmm. has to, it has to be the, in the tropics and in warm climates, basically agricultural goods. So it is, in some ways, it is fundamentally, I think, an agriculture. It, it's, it's at least it's a base of agricultural vision that agricultural goods in those regions have to be grown by non-white people under mm. the coercive supervision of white masters. Mm. And so it's got to be and so and slavery is the best way to do that. And that's going to be the future whether you like it or not. And we need the the United States in a world where Europe is has, you know, ha, European countries have abolished slavery. The United States needs to be the great champion of this. So we need American power to sort of safeguard this um, engine of prosperity throughout the world. I don't think though that that means that they're entirely opposed to i think they see slavery as a very i mean they use these words dynamic capacious flexible institution and if you think about what's happening in the 1850s in places like virginia you know there is early industrialization that's happening and this is a debate where now i'm off my ground of real specialty but i think i think you know certainly you know in mining and in certain kinds of i mean if you think about well the best example i guess is louisiana sugar mills which are in effect factory like in work environments w- in which slavery was extremely or cuban sugar mills which slavery is extremely you know uh, you know there's I, I don't think the south could have industrialized like the north and there's a reason it didn't mm-hmm, this is where mm-hmm. i would draw the line but from a slaveholder perspective it's not incompatible with certain kinds of industrial growth at all okay yeah i mean uh, the, the narrative i feel like you know when i go back to like my orals like the narrative of like eric foner's like the whole conception of like free labor ideology being like this driving force for the north ha, ha, is that is that is that coming up in this literature is that coming up in, in from like these southern powers that are envisioning this kind of holistic national slave uh, yeah, empire yeah that's interesting no you know it's uh, like are are they I thinking guess, about wage are they thinking about in a the sense north? what you're asking i think that what they're ha- okay with is a mixed system i mean okay. really yeah. they're not right. keen on like okay we need to put slavery in minnesota right. you know that's montana needs uh-huh. to be free i mean i think what they want is they're aware that probably in some places in the west uh you know slavery is not going to uh you know they're you know based on climate slavery right. is not i mean that's if you read you know jefferson davis are we uh, yeah if you read jefferson davis um who he, had he a monument gives, go down yeah today, monument think, went down right? today yeah, yeah. so we should be we should be drink we should be toasting his right, honor right. yeah he um if you read his little capsule history which i was reading today because i went back and looked at his message to congress for a little snappy tweet mm-hmm. topical jefferson, yeah. jefferson davis the news topical. i've got a tweet about it yeah yep. Um, and he gives a little capsule history of, of like how slavery developed. And, you know, they're very clear in the North climate makes slavery unprofitable. So that didn't, you know, which is not totally true by the way, because there was actually a intense political struggle to end slavery in the North that they sort of Mm -hmm. write over separate question. Talk to Jim Oaks about that. Um, but, 
Um, uh, but yeah, but that climate is means that slavery is not going to be everywhere, everywhere. But they need slavery to be national in the sense that the federal government has to support it everywhere. Yeah. So it has to support. It's a fundamental property right, and also it's um, you know uh, because it still does have so much room to expand within the South and within the rest of the rest of the hemisphere. The U.S national state needs to be and is the really the only at this point conceivable weapon to sort of supervise that process um from a pro-slavery perspective Mm. um the national government needs to be friendly to slavery in that respect it it doesn't mean that they need to put like slaves in boston or something yeah yeah it's a really it's it's a really different take on on the tensions leading into the civil war because it feels like um it just it just feels like there's a more kind of organized vision of what slavery and what a slave uh, you know what you call a slaveholding republic would be that seems threatening to maybe maybe i mean well, the well, national cer- government well certainly that's how um i mean that's how the republicans saw it right. you know is that they they saw that you know in the 1850s slaveholders you know increasingly on the on the offensive in other ways though i think domestically i mean my view i mean i'm kind of starting to read about um the Republican Party now for another book I want to do about mm-hmm. its rise and its political vision. But, I mean, I think Southerners, in some ways, they're right that, you know, um, that their their vision is the vision that has been the dominant one in the Republic mm-hmm. since uh, since the since the founding. You know, maybe, OK, Thomas Jefferson wasn't, you know, didn't have John C. Calhoun's particular rhetoric on slavery, but he did made no effort to abolish it. Right. And right. slavery as the flourished as the United States flourished. And it's always been a part of, it doesn't have to be the only part. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, but, it, but it's always been sort of fundamental to American economic growth mm-hmm. and American political institutions. And it's the Republicans who actually are rocking the boat mm-hmm. on in the 1850s in a major way. It's the, or it's the free soilites yeah. uh, in the forties who really are the ones who are saying, wait a minute, we're, you know, w- you know, we're, um, w- you know, this order, this, form of property is unacceptable yeah, yeah. this form of um this social institution is evil and it needs to be curtailed um the slaveholders are actually the ones who are like of course they have these galactic international ambitions but domestically i think they're relatively you know as long as you know they, you play the script from 1790 to 1840 um they're happy with that script yeah. in terms of in terms of slavery strength in the union it's working well well i mean i i've heard you describe in other forums the kind of attitude towards slavery i think uh, throughout the whole society was kind of like accepting it as just a normal part of what of what what the the national project was yeah. and, and and in the same way that people look at capitalism today and say you your nancy pelosi's and your your other figures that kind of poo poo the idea of like single payer even they're like it's never going to happen in other words they're there, yeah. I mean, it was, I think it was Pelosi that was asked directly about capitalism by some kid on Twitter. Yeah. You know, we're a capitalist party, right? Yeah. And, and it's just kind of this idea that like some things are never going to change, and it's just a natural order of things. Yeah. And it feels like slave, like you know, it was a big project to intervene on slavery in that way because yeah, it was so deeply entrenched in not only the kind of economic systems of the whole country, but but in the minds of people. Yeah. No. I mean, I think. I guess my take on this is to be a little bit glib and contemporary, uh, you know, for whatever, since we're talking about Pelosi. Sure, yeah. I'll, no, I'll I, run I'd with love it. to bring it to I'll today. run with it. Um, I mean, look, I, I've talked about this before. From a Southern perspective, they're absolutely committed to slavery, and their view is slavery, whatever, even as Britain and various, you know, parts of the North become – move towards anti-slavery, their view is no, slavery – Actually, whatever you you want to get sentimental about it, but the truth is slavery makes the world economy run. Without slavery, you couldn't have cotton, sugar, tobacco. You couldn't have these raw materials that in the 1850s, they're not crazy for thinking were at the heart of a – international economy mm. and you know fuel the mills of you know of, of manchester and lowell and so, it's so just on kind of clear-eyed pragmatic. and it's just it's kind of like you know it's a version of, i think i've said this before but it's a version of you know mark fisher's capitalist realism yes you know where it's like yeah. there is no alt- or margaret thatcher's there is no alternative sure it's like i think they had a pro-slavery there is no alternative yeah a pro-slavery realism mm-hmm. but okay in the north it's interesting because i mean my take on the north is and I think the scholarship is moving towards this, that mm-hmm. if you look at early anti-slavery in the North, it's pretty robust in kind of quiet ways very early on in the sense that all the northern states moved to get rid of slavery despite slaveholders having disproportionate power in places like yep. New York and Pennsylvania where slavery was not – it was never uh, – they were never slave societies like South Carolina. But slaveholders did have 
um, wherever they are in human history, they've always had disproportionate political power. They've yeah. always been rich. They've always been able to pull their w- well, way beyond their weight. And there were real costly political fights. And then in the Northwest Territories, the same thing in, in places like Indiana and Illinois to get – you know, the, slavery wasn't actually – effectively kept out by the by the northwest ordinance there had to be sort of state level political battles in the 18 teens to get rid of slavery Mm -hmm. so northerners were basically this is my big contemporary analogy just like how i think today there's basically a social democratic silent majority Mm -hmm. you know that Mm -hmm. if you look at polls six it's like comes in around 60 percent on pretty much every big kind of bernie sanders ish issue on medicare for all on you know, much larger taxes on the rich, on, you know, breaking up the banks or at least severe regulation of Wall Street, mm-hmm. on, uh, you know, big expansion of the minimum wage, on, um, you free know, free college. college. Yeah. All these things, they, 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 they pull pretty reliably at that range. Now, okay, they, that hasn't sort of been born the test of political back and forth. And, you know, of course, those numbers will change and vary. And you need to some, – some of those issues have not really – you know, they're, those those beliefs are thin. You could say they're they're not they're they're thinly held. But that's there, there's a kind of a basis for a kind of social a believing a social democratic silent majority. Um, I think that was how the North felt about slavery, mm. and that most mm. Northerners, some Northerners, you know, were were very cool with slavery. Most didn't care that much, but many were kind of. No, slavery's bad. I don't want it in my state. Yeah, I'm not gonna. Yeah. Re- I'm not gonna build my political career around opposing it. Right. But uh, I don't like it. I, I can see that it's an evil, wow. and I don't want it. So what it, there had to what there had to what happened over the course of the 1840s and 50s is a political struggle to sort of make slavery move from the margins to the center of politics, wherein that silent majority could kind of be awakened. And uh, now that's so great. And now I see I see where you're headed with your next yeah. project and thinking about the Republican yeah, yeah, Party because yeah. it's like you know. We're sitting in this analogy that you've that you've drawn for us here. It's it's like we're waiting for our Lincoln right now. You yeah. know, we're waiting for a Republican Party. We're waiting for someone to gather all that disparate, yeah. you know, maybe thinly held, but yeah. definitely their yeah. political energy. Create a fucking platform out of yeah. it, inject it into the Democratic Party, yeah. and take over the country yeah. and build the country we want. Yeah. I mean, I, I I can believe it just sitting here listening. Yeah. Um, and I'm generally a pretty cynical person, but I feel like you're right in terms of that energy being. You know, spread thin, but definitely there. It's definitely there, and yeah. So I don't think the Republican. I don't think like the Republicans could have succeed, succeeded. They didn't transform political belief overnight into right. Oh, suddenly now we hate slavery. Uh, they were able to tap something that was already there, mobilize it, and move it from the margins to the center of politics. Now, in part, they were aided. As I think people said, uh, you know, I think uh, Joshua Giddings has a good line about like the perversity of the South has always led to the advance of the North. Yeah, you yeah. know that. Um, knock knock, it's a cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a cat trying desperately to get into the room right <laughs> I now. I can't. No, you're the, not the allowed. The cat really here. wants to hear your points about about uh, about slavery. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah the, the the perversity of the South has always led to the advance of the North, and there, there's a certain truth to that. That mm-hmm. that you know, our best, this you know, anti-slavery guys would say our best allies are these pro-slavery extremists, and that you know, something like Stephen Douglas's um, you know Nebraska bill with yeah. the push yeah. through with the connivance of slaveholders, with the insistence of slaveholders, you know, definitely outright the North and kind of all sorts of things like the caning of Charles Sumner over oh, the yeah. course of the yeah, 50s yeah. aggravated people and made people sort of put slavery at the front and center. So there was definitely a dialectic uh, in national politics that was happening and the kind of the, the confidence and the certainty of slaveholders that mm. in part that I talk about in the book push the advance the ball for anti-slavery in a kind of weird way. But um, nevertheless, like mm-hmm. – it took it, it, the the other half of it was a kind of a, yeah it was what you just described a kind of um, you know over the course of in a very fits and starts kind of way people like not really Lincoln in a way it was more like people like Giddings or sure. uh, Salmon P Chase or mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Uh, you know uh, uh, Henry Wilson in Massachusetts kind of working together in the course of a very hostile two party system mm. uh, you know Whigs and yeah. Democrats yeah, yeah. to try to sort of build a coalition that would recenter politics on. Uh, opposition, if not to slavery, at least to the slave power, and then ultimately to push that towards slavery. And that, you know, they were, you know, that was a kind of contingent struggle that structures helped determine, but I think you can't write out the sort of contingent political effort that the Republicans made, and they they did it. And it took them, you know, it took them, Republicans, the anti-slavery politicians um, and forces did it. I mean, urged on by abolitionists who, you know, played an important role in building the momentum Mm -hmm. for these ideas. 
pushing, you know, kind of carping from the left about it. Um, With but, no Twitter whatsoever. Yeah, exactly. Um, kind of like always pushing. And I think that uh, I think that kind of coalition, you know, what Charles Sumner called the anti-slavery enterprise, yeah. you know, that ranged from Frederick Douglass on the left to, um, you know, or Wendell Phillips on the left to somebody like, um, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, William Fessenden of Maine or something mm-hmm, on mm-hmm. the on the right or a, kind of a moderate Republican on the right. Um you know, was it was enough to build? They they, they built a majority, yeah, and uh, they were able to do that's stuff the, with that that's majority. The, that's the the the, yeah. the goal, right? Is yeah, to build that majority, which feels like it's already kind of there. If if it could be grasped, uh, that you yeah. said like it's, silent majority, but it's it's. I think it can be grasped, and I think I don't think well, our situation is different. If you want to run with this sure. metaphor, yeah. like they were able to in a lot of places, like in the late eighteen forties, these uh, anti slavery. People like Chase in Ohio, for instance, were able to sort of, you know, they had, they had, in the 1848, the Free Soil Party broke off and got like 12% of the vote. Right. So you had a situation where it was sort of like, okay, you had a third party that was kind of a tiebreaker in a lot of places. And in some places it would ally with the Republicans and in some, I mean, with the, with the, with the Whigs. And in some places it would ally with the Democrats. Yep. And it would kind of get, that's how they got Chase and Sumner in the Senate in Ohio and Massachusetts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they would sort of play the parties against each other and sort of, you know, coalition and fuse. And then, and then when, Kansas and Nebraska came, they were ready to sort of explode onto the scene yeah. and sort of become the new big party as the Whigs sort of fell apart. Um, our situation is a little different because the, I, I can't imagine any – even if the, we did get – I don't think third-party politics are the answer mm. in our current situation because mm. there's no prospect of even any kind of cynical alliance with Republicans You know, in the current situation. Say Bernie peeled off – and won, you know, 12% in the last election or something. I think he might have even won more. But say he only won – maybe he would have won less. Who knows? Say he won 12% um, and, you know, or in the next election there's a Bernie-like candidate who wins 12%. I just don't see how that – Yeah. there's any prospect of like, okay, we're going to actually like form an alliance with hmm. um, <laughs> with the GOP against the Democrats. Yeah. It's just yeah. It'll the be ideological different. sorting is different. But I think in the, 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 the most basic sense about transforming – a you know a, a a party system to make it center on the issues that you think are fundamental mm-hmm. um you know and for me they're about economic democracy and power sure then um yeah that's it is comparable in that sense yeah and and i, I feel like there are, and it includes jacobin but other other kind of like left outlets l- lately but but for a long time have looked to the civil war as a kind of model of how to how to take on a big national project and change the kinds of things that seem totally unchangeable in this society um yeah. Matt carp yeah we could go on forever but wow thank, thank you so much right. for, I, I really appreciate you telling me your story and okay how you got to this. I yeah i think it. we're i think i think that's good we did we we stopped off in like maybe 2005 but that's fine yeah, we don't need no, to go into the obama years we'll pick it up again <laughs> part I two hear, i want to hear a lot more about uh, uh about your take on politics thanks so much i appreciate it all right it. thanks Okay, big thank you to my guest, Matt Karp. I had a great time talking about uh, the Civil War and Bernie Bros and Mario Kart and all that stuff. Uh, and I hope you'll come back on the show and do an AM/FM episode with me because uh, I had a good time. And you can pick up Matt's book, uh, This Vast Southern Empire, Slaveholders at the Helm of American Foreign Policy. Uh, really, really interesting take on the on the forces that led up to the Civil War. Um, and I thank you for listening to the show. Uh, you can find more Nostalgia Trap stuff uh, at patreon.com slash nostalgia trap. Subscribe to the show and I will send you stuff in the mail and give you bonus episodes and other stuff. Thanks so much. Talk to you next time. <laughs>